Hello and welcome to this Red Gamer Tech video, myself Amar Tomat, as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours, so what do I have for you today my friends? Well, we're going to kick things off with a little something from Intel. So what we have here is some listings from Norwegian and Finnish online stores for four chips, some KF models in the ninth generation. We have the 9900KF, i7-9700KF, 9600KF and the 9400KF. Now these are processors that either have their integrated graphics disabled or they just don't have them at all. The KF extension is to basically say, yep, these do not have an iGPU, but they do have an unlocked base clock multiplayer multiplier, excuse me, um, but the 9400F has a locked multiplier and also lacks the iGPU, so just keep that in mind. So what do we actually see in terms of the clock speeds here? Well, the 9900, 9700 and 9600KF are pretty much identical with their siblings that have the iGPU equipped, with the 9900KF having 3.6 gigahertz uh, base clock and 5 gigahertz boost. The 9700 has 3.6 and 4.9 gigahertz boost. The 9600 has 3.7 base and 4.7 boost. However, we do see the 9400 have a little bit of a boost versus its brethren with 2.9 gigahertz base and 4.2 gigahertz boost. Now, the prices that we have here are undoubtedly placeholders. So we should wait for an official announcement from Intel before we start analysing that too much, but it is there on screen for you in case you were curious as to what was going on there. So what do we have next for you? Well, we actually have some performance leaks for the RTX 2070 Max-Q. So obviously this is for a mobility graphics card here and the Max-Q variant as well. But what we have here, thanks to the well-known leaker Tom Apisak, who again, I always feel like I'm butchering the pronunciation of his name, but, you know, I'd... Uh. Anyway, what we have here is a Final Fantasy XV benchmark for this card, which shows that the RTX 2070 mobility, at least the Max-Q one, is going to be pretty much going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, or even going above and beyond the efforts of the previous top-end cards, like the GTX 1080 and the Vega 60. Now, that is just in this particular benchmark. That is 100% worth stressing. One benchmark it does not give you a complete picture of a chip's performance, regardless of what chip you're talking about, regardless of what game you're talking about. It is just one benchmark. But it is sort of one piece of the puzzle, and obviously as we get more leaks, as we undoubtedly will do, as we are expecting a reveal of this particular GPU at CES, it just gives us a sort of sort of peek, I guess, of what we can expect from this particular GPU. So I'd say wait and see for more benchmarks before getting overly excited, but this is definitely looking promising to say at least, and I look forward to seeing more. But we have yet another development in the Qualcomm versus Apple thing coming right up next. Now you may recall that not too long ago I discussed how a court in China basically ruled in favour of Qualcomm basically allowing for a ban of certain iPhone models in that particular country from being sold and now we have a similar thing happening again but this time in Germany on the case that Apple is infringing Qualcomm's patents. Now in Germany, at least, the infringing patents cover the functioning of envelope tracking. And it's just basically related to increasing power efficiency. And Qualcomm was basically saying that Apple's implementation of it in certain devices infringes on their patents. Now, which devices are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the iPhone 7 and iPhone 8, which rely on Intel modems and Corvo ET chips. Now... The ban is not currently actually in place at the time of recording. It is just obviously been granted by the German courts. Qualcomm needs to post a bond of 668.4 million euros before this will actually be enforced. And obviously Apple has going to, well, is going to be appealing the injunction. Now, even if you say that Apple fails in their injunction, Germany says, nope, you know, Qualcomm has released enough of a case here for us to ban the sale of these particular devices in Germany, you know, suck it up buttercup or release new versions without these patents being infringed or what have you. It's important to remember that this is only stopping Apple from selling them. 
That doesn't mean the phones won't be available anymore to customers as they will remain on sale through resellers. So it basically just means, assuming this even stays in place, an Apple store cannot sell these phones. And I do have a direct quote here from Apple regarding the court's decision and they said quote we are of course disappointed by this verdict and we plan to appeal all iphone models remain available to customers through carriers and resellers in 4300 locations across germany during the appeal process iphone 7 and 8 models will not be available at apple's 15 retail stores in germany iphone xs xs max and xr will remain available in all our stores now, obviously, a lot of people are going to be going for the, you know, the latest and greatest, like the top end and the newest phone. But the iPhone 7 and 8 are obviously going to be significantly cheaper and are still good phones considering they have been out a fair while now. So this is definitely going to hurt Apple, especially given that we've had a similar ruling in China as well. But obviously, they're not just going to take this lying down. We may very still this very, very much see, excuse me, this decision reversed when they appeal or it could stay in place, and it's still going to hurt just a little bit if they do actually stick with this particular ruling. So, um, an interesting one. I genuinely thought, like, yep, once they've gotten to court, that's the last we hear of it for, of it for a while, because, you know, legal proceedings tend to move very, very slowly, but it's actually just, it's just kind of escalated even more since then, if anything. So, what do we have next? Well, we actually have a bit of a cool joining of forces here as IBM are going to be using Samsung 7nm. So what we have here is IBM has announced that they have signed an agreement with Samsung and they're going to produce their next generation processors. Now this includes CPUs for IBM Power Systems, IBM Z and Linux One Systems and these are all going to be using Samsung 7nm EUVL fabrication process. Now they were previously working with global foundries but they have, of course, decided to abandon development of 7NM and more advanced technologies. So obviously IBM have understandably gone with a company who has decided not to go that route. Especially given that IBM and Samsung have worked together in other areas for various semiconductor production materials and technologies as part of IBM, as part of, excuse me, IBM's research alliance. So this obviously made perfect sense for IBM just to be like, you know, Global Foundries, they're not going to be doing it for us anymore. So how about we just kind of expand our relationship with Samsung, which makes perfect sense, really. Now, unfortunately, neither company had anything to say at all as to what exactly Samsung is going to be producing for IBM. Um, based on IBM's current roadmap for power processors, 2019 CPUs are still going to be global foundries and these are going to be made on 14 nm so it's going to be the ones that are in 2020 and later that are going to be using a different architecture that's most likely when we're going to be seeing samsung's chips for ibm actually come out into the market so it's not going to be something that's going to affect us anytime soon and of course if you don't use IBM's products it's not going to affect you at all but it's uh, still interesting nonetheless. So we're going to finish things up today with a little bit of gaming news as things are not all that well at Blizzard if you believe these new reports. Now the first thing we have here is a new report on Kotaku who have basically said that they have got various inside sources that Blizzard have been cutting development costs hard and this apparently has been a company-wide policy thanks to their new chief financial officer Amrita Ahuja who joined Blizzard in March after spending a long long time over at Activision and apparently they said to every team that they had to reduce spending and according to Kotaku's report several former and current Blizzard employees basically said that the finance group is now leading strategic decisions for the first time in the company's history and we have kind of seen Blizzard going more and more that way over the last few months, of course. I, I don't need to bring up the Diablo Immortal thing because, good lord. Anyway, we have a bit of a statement here from one of Kotaku's sources which reads, quote, Over the course of last year, Blizzard have been very actively trying to find ways to cut costs that won't draw negative press attention. That speech from Amrita about cutting costs, that wasn't a one-time thing. We were told to cut costs on a monthly basis. Finance in general in Blizzard has been one of those invisible functions that that's there but doesn't have a say. Now they're suddenly in meetings. A lot of decisions now have been driven by business folks, marketing and finance folks. There's a real struggle now between developers and business people. Strategic decisions are being led by a finance group. 
Blizzard in a special place. A lot of people are w worried about the future of Blizzard. If the Activision method seeps in more, what's that going to become? Now, again, we have seen Blizzard, you know, kind of go down a concerning path, shall we say, over the last few months. Of course, you know, they've come under fire for the Diablo Immortal is the most recent example and their development schedule has come under fire as well from a lot of fans as well and their well the Overwatch loot box system is cosmetic only they have also been criticized for their implementation of that you know, there's been some arguing that they have kickstarted this whole craze for loot boxes in every game under the sun at least that's what it feels like at times anyway and we also have a report that over 100 employees are going to be leaving the EU customer services. And according to Blizzard, this isn't going to have any negative effect on their customer service support, but 100 employees, they're going to be feeling the pinch in that office. Now, according to Eurogamer, three these employees were leaving from the Cork Island section and they left voluntarily because they were offered a good amount of money to do so. And basically, according again to this report from Eurogamer, Blizzard are offering buyouts from its main customer service support in Cork in Ireland and these employees are going to be leaving later this month. So essentially what this program is, is that the staff are offered a significant amount of money and they leave the company obviously and then they can pursue other career opportunities. And apparently this voluntary program was offered more than five times and the amount of money increased each time and was now equal to a year's pay, which is obviously why the employees were like, okay, all right, I'll do that, why not? And apparently according to several sources who were employees who either didn't take this deal or did take this deal is not mandatory, it's something that is offered. But to be honest, I can't really blame them for taking it because it's like, if it's a year's pay, why wouldn't you? Because like, yeah, you just find another job or whatever and even if you don't for a few months, you're fine. Like... Why would you not? So the question is obviously why Blizzard have done this. It's hard to really say. It's obviously great for the employees now leaving Blizzard, but obviously now the EU customer service office is going to be left very much feeling those absence of those employees. I can almost guarantee it. Like Blizzard can go, oh no, it's fine. You know, we've got good staff. We're going to be picking up the slack, blah, blah, blah. But this is 100, not 1 or 10 or 50, 100. I don't care how big this office is, you're going to feel the lack of those 100 people. And they have now announced that their customer services are going to be closed by 5pm, so they're already kind of feeling it in terms of that. So, yeah, if it takes a little bit longer to get an answer in the EU from Blizzard for any customer service related things, um, that's probably why. <laughs> anyway, that's me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Um, I'm going to be off for Christmas Day, uh, Boxing Day, I don't actually know what I'm doing yet, to be honest, my family is not the most organised, but I hope you all guys have a lovely Christmas Eve tomorrow, and of course a wonderful Christmas Day, or if you don't, if you don't celebrate, then just happy holidays, have a good one, and I'll see you soon, bye bye.